break. Let it go again. Uh, have we any apologies? Morning, uh, Chairman. Morning, Members. Just to confirm, full attendance, 19 members present, Chairman. Thank you. Have we any declarations of interest? No. Just remind everybody that the uh, meeting will be recorded and the recording will be subsequently available for public listening. Uh, I'll move the minute of the meeting of 16th of July. Can I have a second, Dar? Happy right. second, Chair. Thank you. Move on to the service review, community learning and development, report by the Director of Community and Customer Services. This report outlines the scope of the CLD review and is asking members to agree the scope and the full details of the structure of the current service and how it operates, breakdown of resources, is included in Appendix 2, and Appendix 1 gives us full scope. This initial work already shows the potential for further savings and the redevelopment of provision further down the line. Jimmy Ferguson and Harry Hay are both here to answer members' questions. Anything to add, gentlemen? No, thanks, Chair. Happy to go straight to questions if members have any. Any questions? Councillor Driver up. Thanks very much, Chair. I mean, there are obviously some obviously some good work being completed by CLD across area and region level, and there are some opportunities to increase this by ensuring there is further partnership working. That will require some well laid out plans and productive quality indicators for the service to move forward. That will need time and, and commitment from offices, officers in the service, and I, I need reassurances that the timeline gives enough time uh, and resource for this to be fully done with regards to the recommendations. I don't want to come be coming back in April 2015 looking to extend this. I also need reassurance that the partners, which there are many working with CLD, will fully participate in, in the, the service review and, and hope to take CLD forward in that way. I think we can reassure members on the, on the timeline for the current service review. I think Councillor Driver is maybe alluding to the fact that we've, we've made reference to the possibility of extending the review process to cover not only CLD, but the employability provisions across the and Galloway Council and indeed with partners. So we would probably come back with a timeline for that extended review to, if not the next meeting, certainly the one after that. But this one, we the timeline's acceptable for what we're doing. It's a fairly narrow focus one within CLD itself. Thank you. Take Councillor Geddes, then Councillor Maitland. Thanks very much indeed, Chair. Uh, the, the, the issue is there are a number of issues in relation to the report as far as I'm concerned, sir, and, you know, I, I'm not entirely clear as to the rationale, uh, you know, b behind the, the bringing forward of the report at this moment in time. I, I would have to say that, uh, regrettably, uh, the report makes clear, uh, and I would commend, the, commend the, the author for his candour, that this service has not been performing as well as uh, it should be. So is that the real rationale for bringing the report forward at this moment in time, or is it by virtue, Chair, of the supervening legislation in the form of the statutory instrument and the requiry on us to produce a three-year plan as from the 1st of September next year, or is it really uh, 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 another way of looking at effecting the necessary budget savings, uh, as it were, to allow us you know, to meet sort of budgetary demands? So it would be helpful, sir, you know, to get maybe a bit of clarity in that. And furthermore, uh, Chair, I also feel that paragraph 5.4 of the report, we're talking about challenge panel being set up, uh, and there's various uh, members, uh, there's various, uh, the, the composition of that is set out. Now, uh, it would seem to me that, this, and I'm conscious of the fact here, it's not appropriate for elected members to stray into operational matters, although we have a locus on appropriate occasions, but it would seem to me that part of this review process is tailor-made for a much more uh, detailed elected member involvement and input than what this report, I would have to say, Chair, envisages. Uh, I will, at the risk of alienating certain of my colleagues, and I'm, uh, I, I will make reference to the fact that perhaps this is maybe something for an elected member of sub working group to take this forward and to develop it as appropriate. But I'll, as always, Chair, I'll be interested to hear colleagues' responses. Thanks. Mr. Geddes, I, th I think each one of the issues you've raised is the reason why the service review is forward. Uh, obviously, we have got supervening legislation, which we're going to have to comply with. That's a much bigger piece of work. We were required, all services were required to bring forward possible service reviews with, as a way of making savings, and if that is going to happen. We are improving as a service across the piece. I think if you look at the timeline, uh, we're, we're improving in HMI inspection report as, as time goes on. There is still further room for improvement. I think we'll use this process to identify that. I think the, the wider review that, that, that Councillor Driver was mentioning 
will be a far more detailed review and will be cross-cutting, cross-service. This one is fairly narrow. You'll see the savings that we're, we're proposing are between £103,000 and, and £200,000. Uh, so basically, th this is a very basic look at our own service. We will achieve improvements as a consequence of it. Can I say that we're following a template which the Council agreed for service review? That's why the template is set out this way. So I do take the point about member involvement. I think uh, we've already had one in CHES uh, recently where the report came forward in very similar terms, same format. What we're trying to do is get a consistent way forward on service review. I do take the point about a challenge panel. I think what the challenge panel will be doing will be not so much looking at the policy or the politics of it, but saying, is that really going to work? Are you going to save any money there? And I think that's a job for, for, for particularly finance officers and, and myself as director. But members will have a good deal of input when the next report comes up. All you're doing today is agreeing the scope. Once we, you've agreed the scope, let's take it forward and we'll come back to members in full detail. And at that point, I would hope you'll have member involvement. In. Hope that's yeah, helpful. Yeah. Great, grateful for the response, Chair. Um, th thank you, Chairman. Um, I was quite intrigued to read through this uh, to look at the levels of staffing um, in each of the areas. Um, and um, while I absolutely recognize that one must apply our resources to where they are most needed and going to be most effective, um, I think it's quite important, though, for the purposes of the public, understanding where their money is being spent um, and um, to be sure that some areas are not starved of resources inappropriately. Um, I think that that should be absolutely upfront and visible. Um, those of us who received a report on the youth bank um, recognized quite clearly that there were absolutely no applications from the stewartry, and it was the youth bank report that had to reiterate that there was no staff there to able to support youth work in the stewartry. Uh, and uh, with the best of them in the world, that's not appropriate. So I'm hoping that this um, review will make absolutely crystal clear what level of support and staffing go into each of the areas. Uh, I hope that that will be clear. If I could possibly go on just to the second point, which is about um, not having um, a strategic community learning and development partnership at the moment, Chairman. Um, I recognize the importance of, I think actually Councillor Driver touched on the whole thing, and I, I fully recognize that we must go with Christy on this and be sure that we are not uh, operating in, in, single, in single ways. Um, so can I also ask that this review makes how that will happen, and again, what resource will be placed exactly where, um, so that we again can see where resource is going. You know, I, I am suspicious of something that says, oh, we need to centralize and coordinate. Instantly, I think to myself, hang on a wee second. Harry. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Councillor Maitland, in terms of the, the current arrangements across Dumfries and Galloway, um, some of them are very much based on historical arrangements and historical provision. And one of the, uh, the, the key features of a service review is to look at not only what resources we've currently got, but what members consider to be priorities for investment and spend, be it from an early prevention perspective, or be it from building communities' capacities, or be it from a youth work um, dimension. So one of the key outcomes of our service review is going to make it quite clear to elected members exactly what resources we've got, based on what we think members' priorities are, how we um, um, propose to, to deploy them, and then members can make decisions on that, um, on that basis. Um, the second point that was made about the strategic community learning partnership there isn't a formal one in place at the moment, although that's not to say there's not a lot of informal discussions going along with, um, with key partners. And uh, I feel that this service review is going to act as a catalyst to um, you know, facilitate that type of discussion. As has already been said, um, by September next calendar year, we need to have a, a Dumfries and Galloway plan in place that um, our department um, has got the role to, to lead on that. And that process in itself will ensure that there is that strategic joined up working across all the key partners um, in Dumfries and Galloway. May I come back? Thank you, Chairman. Um, so will we be able then to read across? We're going to receive area profiles. You know, we're going to have a look and see what uh, each of our communities looks like. 
Um, ideally, through the area committees, we would see, in fact, what each of our wards looks like. Um, and I would like to see, and I, I say before, I, I'm not interested in simply applying people to an area because there's a number of people there. I want to apply it to problems. But I can only be sure that it's being applied correctly um, if I can see that there is a read across from what our profiles look like um, and, uh, and what is being applied to sort problems out. Thanks, Chair. Um, we're currently putting the finishing touches to the, the four area profiles in conjunction with the, the Creighton Institute. And you're quite right that that will give a, a lot of um, um, intelligence about what the demographics, what the profiles are of the, the, the four areas. Um, and uh, that will help um, inform uh, in a, an evidence-based way exactly where, evident, uh, where investment should go in the future. So those area profiles will form an important part of this, this process. And they'll be available for elected members on an area committee basis in the very near future. Thanks very much. Councillor Ferguson and Councillor Thoms. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Um, a two-pronged question, really. Uh, first bit is under 5.4. I notice there is no uh, service user involved in the, um, the challenge panel. Given that this department's role is to actually uh, build up the role of community groups and to uh, give them self-confidence and everything else, I would have thought it was imperative that they were inv involved there because... Um, if you take the Education Scotland person, um, there is no external um, uh, review or scrutiny there. And you could hardly call Education Scotland an uh, like independent organisation. They're, they're who you're, you're getting all your, your tech, what your technical expertise from. Um, so that, that's more a, uh, just a comment rather than, rather than a question. The, my question really is it's about the percentage ratio um, between young people and adults and the appropriateness um, of where this, these, these reports and how this is all tied in together, because um, we know that, um, for example, the adult side of CLB is in, involved in uh, the integration of health social care, um, and the younger person, the ones involved in the integration from uh, school to adulthood, is involved with the education service. Um, we, are, is this review going to be able to look and say, well, hang on a minute here, this is a bit like social work, for example, where we've got um, two separate functions, but also have a bridge between the two to make sure that, that nobody gets missed out here. So how are we actually going to tackle um, uh, that percentage ratio? Because when you look at it, it seems geared very heavily, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not having a pop here for this, but very heavily towards young people, um, where is the adult learning side uh, right across the region? Thanks, Chair. In relation to the first point, um, as uh, Mr. Haswell's already mentioned, the, the, this follows the, the, the agreed corporate um, um, service review toolkit, and our challenge panel has been very much led by, um, by that document. Although, at the moment, a service user isn't um, featured on the um, challenge panel, service users will be very much involved in um, the consultation process, you know, in terms of coming up with options and seeking their views about what they feel about current provision, et cetera. So they certainly will um, have an important role. Um, in relation to the second point, I guess it goes back to um, an earlier comment I've made about where our priorities are. Um, absolutely, it's important to effectively engage with young people for a whole uh, variety of reasons, but equally, it's also important to ensure that um, adults have got the, the support and um, resources that, that they need. So this service review will look at what our um, corporate priorities are moving forward and how our um, service and partners and resources and funding that we've got at our disposal can help ensure we get the maximum return for our investments. So all service users and uh, current provision and future priorities will be looked at, Councillor Ferguson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm a little bit confused about uh, what CLB is, just from reading the report. As far as I understand it, there's a, a community learning and development regulation, right? And the Education Authority or Council has to come up with a plan by 2015, which to me seems like a leadership role for the local authority rather than a delivery role per se. So, but when we're looking at the report, Refers to, it sort of blurs the distinction between CLD as a community planning partnership uh, issue 
and one where it's a service within the council. So when you're reading through the actual paper, it's a wee bit confusing as to whether it's we're playing a strategic role or a delivery role. CLD seems to refer to both, and, and I think a wee bit of clarity in that might be helpful because I'm concerned we're uh, misinterpreting what our role is perhaps in terms of local authority providing that leadership and joined up working rather than focusing on the delivery. So why do we have a CLD service when really we should be providing that role as a leadership to draw all together all the partners? So it's just a wee bit of understanding on, on these definitions. Thank you. Try to answer that, Councillor Thompson. Um, CLD, along with the regulations, has a set of strategic guidance for community learning and development proposed by Scottish Government. And I think it's fair to recognise that there have been changes in the thinking around strategic importance of community learning and development and how community learning is going to be delivered. Um, historically, within Dumfries and Gallery, I think it's possibly fair to say that community learning and development is very much work of the strategic guidance points community learning and development much more in the direction of partnership and working and places on local authorities responsibility to lead on that partnership working. And that's not only partnership working among internal partners within the council, external partnerships with partners and there's an increasing recognition of the role that a variety of uh, workers play in delivering community learning and development and they're under a huge variety of names and under kind of different local control. Some of them And I think I think you're correct. There is that there is that responsibility and that accountability pulling together the partnership and the leadership of those partners. Every time a secondary school is inspected at, at the moment here in Scotland, what's called the learning community is also inspected. And that that's been on the go now since two thousand. By learning community is meant all of the partners delivering outcomes development. And those outcomes are those outcomes, fairly broad outcomes. They're about community capacity building. They're also about curriculum for excellence. So CLD helps to co deliver curriculum for excellence to help drive the achievement of learning community uh, in the recognition of the achievement of the school. It's also about uh, early intervention, prevention, health care, workplace, home, uh, but what broadened a lot more in terms of the definition. There still is a part of community learning and development, I have to say, that's about delivery, that's about building that credibility and that um, knowledge in the local community. So community learning and development workers do work on the ground do have that credibility and responsibility to create those partnerships and relationships and partnerships and work Thank you for that. That's very helpful. Um, and I think I think it touched just even during your, your response there, uh, the use of the phrase community learning development actually raises the question again because as far as I can see, ed people who work in education are community learning development workers. People who work in social work community learning development work, you know, and all the different partners that are delivering community learning and development are the workers delivering that. So it seems to be, as I say, this is where the confusion for me lies. All of these partners are delivering community learning and development, and it's almost like we've invented something else to also do that. And, and one of the parts of the report mentions about reducing duplication. So are, are we at risk that we're focusing too much on the delivery as a separate from the different parts of the council that are already doing that and separate from the different partners that are already doing that when we should be focusing more on the leadership and providing the framework and partnership agreements by which this delivery can take place. 
So is that what we're working towards with a plan for next year? Or are we still caught up in the sort of legacy work that's been carried out to date with this as a service within the council? I think that's where the a uh, uh, large part of the like some of the discussion that we've discussed in the council is that it's part of the larger process that's going. Community learning and development, just to be specific, is still about still about outcomes for young people. It's the informal side of learning for young people as well. For example, schools do a very good job, for example, education does a very good job of that formal side of learning. Community learning and development is it, it's, it's specifically about the side of learning that we see as uh, additional and external to what schools do. And at the same time, in terms of support to, let's say, older people and uh, services for older people in communities, I think it's recognised that community learning and development as well has had a specific role in that which may be about working with communities to look at how they can co-deliver services that are, you know, to support older people rather than the direct case work with, with older people and the other clients that may come to the kind of provenance of social work. There are, there are distinctions within, you know, you could almost draw the Venn diagram and say there are parts that are within community learning and development and parts that are sort of outside services. But I think part of that connectivity, how well those services that are delivering some of that work connect with each other so that we get the maximum value from the various services uh, in the voluntary sector and in the, you know, the statutory services in the council, how we start to bring those together and have the conversation uh, based on profiling about what's actually needed within our communities, what assets and resources we have to deliver that among us all and get it joined up well enough so that we can actually get a bit more coherence in how the delivery matches and fits in an area. I think that's the sort of conversation that we have to have in more depth with a, with a variety of partners. Any further questions? No. Uh, so, I mean, in essence, what you're saying is CLD service within the council is a facilitator rather than a de deliverer. I think we're still at a bit of a halfway house in that, although I think the facilitation aspect is certainly increasing, although I wouldn't, I don't know I would name it the facilitation as aspect. I think it's the leadership aspect, often the support aspect, um, and I think the two go together. Some of our third sector and our voluntary partners, there's a bit of that as a leadership aspect, there's a bit of it as a, a support and a training aspect. It's about, there certainly is that bit about getting the, the connections right and getting the planning right around community learning and development and there's a leadership bit and a coaching there. Um, for all, for, for all Scottish. Thanks very much, Chair. I, I, I may say, for the record, sorry, I find uh, Mr. Ferguson's responses particularly helpful uh, and, and illuminating. But is there not, uh, you know, yes, we've got to have the conversation. Yes, we've got to, you know, translate that into, you know, sort of a much more effective future than perhaps is the case in the past. But, you know, there are areas where this service at the moment is already providing good outcomes. And my worry would be that as part of that process, that ability to continue to provide these outcomes we no care for might suffer. Can we have uh, an assurance, Chair, that uh, that will be recognised and, 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 and borne in mind and, and guarded against? Thanks, Chair. Uh, Councillor Gerris, um, one of the things that we're focusing on very much in this um, review process is uh, examples of best practice, examples of work that's already having um, high quality outcomes. And that's not just our Council telling us it working with partners such as Education Scotland. So certainly what we want to do is maximise where um, investment is currently having very good outcomes. Um, we, don't want to, um, we don't want to reduce those. We don't want to move away from those. For no other questions, move on to the recommendation. Oh, John. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just to listen to the discussion, uh, 
represent uh, an area of deprivation, uh, I do. I, I think it is very important that we look at the good practice in the past and ensure that that continues. The work that has been done in, in my area, especially in Kirkconnell and Callow Home, has been tremendous uh, with the input of CLD. And I've supported myself personally on a lot of supports that we've been able to bring in. For instance, we're having a community futures meeting tonight that was, uh, we were able to achieve through uh, coal field regeneration. But I wouldn't have been able to drive that forward if it hadn't been for the support of CLD. So there's a lot of initiatives been brought to our area. The father and children's groups have been na nationally acclaimed, bringing together men that wouldn't normally go to a school setting and bringing even grandfathers and everybody in. And that has had a tremendous effect on young people, especially in their transition to secondary school, which is in another area. So I think it is very important that we look at the good practice that's already been there. And uh, as my colleague said, that that, that continues because it's been absolutely vital in the regeneration of your area. Absolutely. I think, as, as Jamie's already touched on, what the service review aims to do overall in a nutshell is look at what the priorities are in Dumfries and Galloway um, and who, uh, in terms of what partner, is, is best to deliver that and make a, a better use of the resources that we've got at our disposal. That, in a nutshell, is what we're looking to do. Chair. Thank you very much. Move on to the recommendations now. 2 1, consider scoping, uh, scoping document. We've done that. 2 2, read the scope template. Desire that it comes out lined at Appendix 1. And 2 3, recognise the potential for further review of services, providing community learning and development activity, and that recommendations for further cross service review will come forward through this work. I think arising from some of the questions that members have asked, we've given undertakings by officers and we'll ensure that these undertakings are carried. Okay, can we move on to item five, which is the uh, regional archive local study report. It's a very, very full report, but I think probably we would just take member questions if members have any questions on the, the generality or the specifics. Uh, hopefully Graham and Harry can, can answer them. I think it's a very uh, full report. It's been a longer gestation period than an elephant, so finally we've got to the, uh, the outcome, and uh, I'll take any questions from members. Councillor Maitland? <laughs> Well, you're right. It has been really, really long. And usually the reason for it being really, really long is because it's really very complicated. Um, and um, I am a little concerned about whether in the length of time that it's taken, um, the way that we actually use and enjoy and need our, our archive has actually changed. Um, I'd like people to explain to me about the balance between accessing digital, digitized records, and the pleasure that is had from that, being able to do that in your local community, as opposed to having trailed into a particular place where we're supposed, I think we're being offered fun and all the rest of it, which is absolutely splendid. But you know, that doesn't square easily with somebody just popping in on a shopping trip um, to go and do some research. I, 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 think, the, I think in many ways, the, the questions that were asked are perhaps questions which were absolutely appropriate maybe three or four years ago, but maybe are less appropriate now. So I, I'd like somebody really to sort of talk me through the, the balance of this particular project now. Uh, I am a little concerned that we are looking too much to think about where it should be in the terms of centralised in the middle of Dumfries, as opposed to thinking about the function of this and whether or not the two functions could sensibly be split. I need a little help on this, please. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, looking at the digitization side, I think you're quite right. That's a huge and growing area, and we should do more and more on that. One of the elements of this project in Dumfries is to set up a digitization suite, which we do not have at the moment. I see that as the crucial element to getting the materials out of an activity. Because you're right, not everybody should have to come into them to, to look at material. That's absolutely right. And what we'd like to do is 
Reviews uh, adoption approach has been pioneered by Highland, where they've used a hub and spoke approach in a, a very large area where they've wanted to try and deal with the geographical problem. So they've um, they've got a central place in Inverness. They've also got one or two physical spokes, uh, places like Portwood and Inverness Street. But they also concentrate heavily and increasingly on digitization in their central places so that they can get access, they can provide access for people, people who want to look at their local history of Whitby, for example. And, and they, they, can, they can do that online. Now, with the best will in the world, we, we, we can't digitize everything immediately. And it's going to take a, a long time to do that. We're at the moment embarking on our first really big digitization project, which is to digitize the Crichton collection, which will be marvelous for everybody in this room and a lot of people outside it. The Wellcome Trust are part of that. And uh, that's about 160,000 images. And that will take two and a half years. Uh, and Glasgow University are going to do that for us because currently we don't have the ability to do that for them. So, um, those records, Crichton records, take up maybe 50 meters of shelving. In 20 years' time, we expect to have about six kilometers of shelving for the digital collection. We've already got four kilometers of shelving. So, it, yes, we'd love to digitize everything, and we will increasingly digitize. What we can do, though, if we have our own resource, is to prioritize what needs to be digitized. If we go Wellcome Trust are great, but they do special kind of funding just for medical collections. And there's other, we'd be able to get other funding from other places in bits and pieces. But to do our own overall view, that's, that's what we'd like to do. We'd like to do that. So we, we, I don't see that um, our approach is outdated, actually, be, because, but I think we can place more weight on the digitization side because I think that is the future. Yes, you are uh, partially been answered by the example given uh, as to Highlands and, 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 and the Highlands of Hope. Uh, and for many of us that, that, that saw uh, in regionalization the changes, you know, many of our records are archived and removed from Stranath, for instance. I'm sure everyone sitting around this table would argue the same out west for free, moving into the place of Central Isle. A lot of people lost out, and it's not a matter of going uh, shopping and then popping into to your centre because all four centres that are contained in here are in Dumfries. And I think it's an argument that we put up to the Scottish Government in terms of when they were decentralising some of their services rather than everything being centralised in Edinburgh, we asked for it to come out. So there is no other place other than Dumfries before us. Uh, and I'm quite sure on the description given, it could have gone to anywhere in the region under digitalization and, 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 and everything. And why is that not the case? Because there are people in Stranraer, as I say, many others could say the same for their own area, who felt they had lost out when many of their records were taken away from Stranraer and put into the York Library, and they do not have access to them. Uh, and you've already said that that would take a bit of time to digitalize and, and all the rest. But still, we're looking at four places, and all four are in Dumfries. Is there a reason for that? Other than uh, has any other part of the region been looked at uh, uh, as a potential to put this uh, under the example given as the hub and spoke? I think I've referred to page 69 of the report. Uh, wrote the long list there. 23 sites were considered. That's the final 23, including all the sites that members of the public have suggested over the past years and all the sites that the SWG uh, identified. Now, obviously, members of the public had made suggestions, but it appeared there's no suggestions from out with them freeze. And bearing in mind that the original remit was set by the Policy and Resources Committee, it would have been up to the Policy and Resources Committee to give that remit back in 2011. And it would appear that the Policy and Resources Committee, who gave the Office of the remit, did not uh, direct them for it to consider them priest in its uh, on its own, or to consider other sites. So the officers have gone ahead, done their job. So I think the answer's in the report. And at the end of the day, all we're here to consider today is this report 
and the four sites that are before us. We're not here to consider any other matter. Stephen Thompson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm conscious that the amount of history increases every day. Um, and you mentioned before about the amount of shelving. <clears throat> Uh, and I was just wondering, what would you say the rate of increase of shelving would be, given that uh, this is an archive is something that will forever grow, uh, and if we're going to be considering issues to do with space and all the rest of it, then that's something that are we planning for the long term for this, and how much room is there to grow, and how what's the rate of increase, if you like? We've, we've, uh, we've got to plan for the long term if we want to get HLF funding anyway, but we certainly do intend to plan for the future. We're looking at the next 20 years, which is what the HLF wants us to look at, and I think it's a reasonable length of time to plan for the immediate future. Um, the rate of increase there, as I've said, we're, we're going from about four kilometers to six kilometers of shelving, we think, over that period. So we're looking at about a 50% increase on what we have now. I see that increase as being bigger in the first few years than later on, as we get more and more digital curation needed for records that are already held electronically, born digital. So a lot of council records now are created in digital form, and often only are only in digital form. And over the next 10 or 20 years, I think that will definitely shift across in that direction, which means that we'll be holding more just purely in digital. So that, in a way, physical storage will become less of an issue, but it'll take a long time to get there. And we've got an awful lot of paper records to take in in the meantime. So I think by the end of 20 years, we'll be seeing a shift across to not needing so much extra space, uh, and but certainly needing an awful lot of service for whatever they happen to end up becoming. So <clears throat> how much space would you need to expand into? I think that's really what I'm getting at is are there constraints? I mean, obviously, we're looking at the sites, but there's certain constraints that are to do with space and the, the sort of footprint, if you like. So just really to get a bit more of your thoughts on that. Um, well, we've allocated around about up to about 800 square metres building space to, to put this shelving in uh, to do us for the next 20 years. It might not need to be quite that much, depending on the configuration of the shelving. You can get two-tier shelving stairway or a lift in, in, one, in a one-story building. So there's different ways of doing that. Um, but, and then after the 20-year period, uh, if, as I believe and a lot of other archivists believe, the, um, the rate of accrual will slow, uh, we'll, we'll probably be looking at, um, say, the next 50 years, uh, another building, but a, a small one to be added uh, to that. But it, it's so difficult because you, you don't know what's going to happen as you use the space. Any other questions? Councillor Maitland. Thank you. Yes, uh, um, Chairman, I don't think anybody is going against the notion of uh, an archive centre or anything like that, but I really do think that we ought to think it through um, uh, very carefully and, and think it through with respect to the other things which are going on in Dumfries. See, it's, it's not entirely clear to me how this, um, and whether, in fact, the um, proposals have been looked at with respect to the new hub, um, the school, the whole business about learning town, I mean, it's, it's not mentioned here. Um, and I, I just would like to be assured, and with the development of the universities, I, I would like to be absolutely reassured that all these particular aspects have been gone into, because you know, the figures that we've got here, I've actually asked for the site costs, and I have got them, and I thank uh, people for that, indicate that in terms of cost, it really doesn't make a great deal of difference. What I don't have is revenue figures um, about what these uh, particular proposals would actually mean. And that would have been helpful, I suspect, for members to have had in front of them. They would have found that um, probably persuasive, but they're not here. And if somebody was to say to me, why on earth did you did you choose that um, uh, as opposed to, did you choose that proposal as opposed to any other? Um, I don't have it, unless I've, unless I've misread the whole thing. 
that I don't think I've got um, clear evidence. For example, um, the Crichton site um, says that there's an allowance for green technology of £156,000 as opposed to the allowance for green technology at the Ewart Library. But I imagine that if you put in more capital um, allowance for green technology, there might be a, a revenue consequence, that there will be less revenue. So that's the sort of thing which I don't have, and I don't think members have it. To answer your first part in terms of the consultation, go to page 70. Again, a public consultation was carried out in February and March 2013, and that was about sites. And if you go on to page uh, 71, it gives you all the answers there. And uh, how important was it for you to have access by car, bus, train, and foot or cycle? 54% said bus, 16% said train, 63% said car, 62% said walking, very important. I mean, they've done a lot, of, a lot of work on this, where the site is going to be. And obviously, they've come down that uh, four in Dumfries and uh, two, two in the town centre, one's preferable to, to the other. I mean, plenty of consultation with people, members have had the opportunity as well. And I think in terms of revenue, I think uh, Mr. Haswell has an answer on the uh, revenue costs. I, I don't know. In, in Appendix 2 to the report, sir, we've endeavoured to give members an indication of what the ongoing revenue implications of this building would be because we were specifically asked uh, to, to produce that. <coughs> the difficulty you've got is Every site is different. It is not physically possible, or I would suggest financially practical, to produce detailed plans for four sites with detailed costings for how they're going to run in five years' time when it's built. I'd say to members, take your pick. What we're saying here is we were asked to go away and look for a site. We identified initially 23. We went out to extensive consultation. We've now narrowed it down to four. And we're saying to members, over to you. You really need to make the decision here. Once you've made the decision, we can then start to actually work up with an architect and whoever else to get the project forward for HLS funding. The thing I can't do just now is give you absolutely down to the last penny how much each of these developments is going to cost. We've done it on the basis of a matrix, which is a well and tried, a tried and tested method of doing these things. But sometimes members have to be asked to make a decision. I'm not suggesting you don't have full this information because the matrix you have sets out what the projected costs are, what the projected running costs would be. It doesn't compare apples with pears, however, and say if we're a bigger biomass boiler over here, it would cost less to run them over there. I think one of the issues with the site is some of the sites are more constrained than others. Therefore, there's less room to put green energy production. Mr. Ferguson. Um, thanks very much, Chair. Uh, my question is, uh, I'm, I'm hoping it's a practical one. I can't see anywhere where it's um, the ability to expand. Because given that, that the, uh, the hard copy records we have, the digitalised records are both going to increase. And um, the way, for example, this council produces the documents every year <laughs> to be archived. Um, it will be a, a, a never-ending uh, uh, conveyor belt. So, can we fix the fact that we get, get the next stage? Can we actually have in here what, what the ability would be of any of the sites to actually expand and hold more? Yes. Well, obviously, looking at the four sites, and you mentioned it briefly in the uh, in the matrix at the end of the um, appendix one. Um, that the two town centre sites, Pickley Street and the Ewart Library, are obviously more constrained space-wise than the um, Penida, Gracefield, or the Crichton. Uh, and there are more opportunities to expand at those latter two sites. Uh, but we do feel that there would be enough room to expand at any of the four sites in the longer run. What we have said for the Ewart site is we might have to attempt to purchase extra premises that currently adjoin the Ewart to make room there. Plew Street, you'd have to expand into the car parks at the back. So again, you're, you're affecting car parking space. But both those things are mentioned in the, in the matrix. So, uh, and like I said, the other two sites, I don't think it would be a, a problem with expansion. Okay, any further questions? Okay, can we move on to the recommendations? Uh, recommendation one is note the background two and the reasons for the project. 
Uh, two, consider four shortlisted options in the Gear Site New Archive and Local Studies Centre, as detailed in Section 3. I think the one that scores the highest points there is the one at the Europe Library. Can we agree to that being the preferred site? Moving on, two, three. Oh, sorry, Councillor Mate, one. Chairman, we really mustn't run on um, without actually looking at this quite seriously. Again, I go back to the issue that I, it is not completely clear to me that this has been looked at in a holistic way with respect to Dunstan. So I'm sorry, but I am not going to agree with the shortlisted option. Um, I think that there should be further consideration of what the developments are in Dumfries with respect to learning plan uh, and um, the future development of digitization and the library service uh, and facilities review. I, I just, I'm quite happy that there still be an archive center. That's not an issue. I'm just wanting to be sure that this has been looked at in a holistic manner. So I think all I'm asking for at this stage is that we stop and consider and be absolutely sure that we're doing the right thing with respect to Dumfries. If you look at the people who have been asked in Dumfries, the question they've been asked is how do they want to get there? And it's Dumfries people who have been asked as well. So forgive oh, me. It's open to everyone. Thank you, Chairman. I mean, I was discussing that with some colleagues about Dick Field in regards to the only part of council meeting's question that wasn't answered when she asked earlier was has there actually been any consideration in regards to the further development through Lennon Hub and such like the Lennon Town and the Dumfries. Was, was that considered in any way before the Centre of Peace kind of as a part of that larger project? Can I say to members, yes, it was the, the project that came forward went to the Council Strategic Asset Board before it came here. Member, it was sent back by the Strategic Asset Board specifically look at those issues. The, the board is taking a wider view of the Priest Town uh, and the, the regional, regional capital of Dumfries and Galloway, and there will be a report coming back to the Policy and Resources Committee about that. So the, the issues were addressed, they were looked at. You come to a stage where you either bring a project forward and ask members to give it approval and go for it, or you keep putting things on the back burner until you've got, what did they call it, a master plan? Yeah. Well, uh, my 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 view, sir, is that we are obliged to uh, determine the site of this proposal and what we do and what we do with the land. Thank you very much, Councillor Geddes. Councillor Thompson. Thank you. Um, well, uh, just on the Ewart Library site, um, and it, it notes the possible future cost of purchasing adjacent premises for expansion uh, after 20 years. I'm just thinking, is there a, a sort of future cost shunt, if you like, um, would it be worth just getting the extra space for now? Because the property price in 20 years time, if somebody knows that it's, we're tunneled into that, or funneled into that um, location, uh, maybe puts a, an added value in the property next door to the, the new facility. So it might actually be better value to get the thing now and then that's recovered. Just a suggestion. Really. Councillor Martin. Just wondering if Graham can tell us, what's the timeline for this? Is it, would it make, is if this keeps getting delayed, has it got an impact on the heritage lottery funding? Yes, we, we have spoken to the lottery fairly recently and they would like us to bring this proposal forward to them as soon as we can. Um, we don't know what the future criteria will be for the for look to the lottery uh, in terms of funding, but uh, it, there's an awful lot of competition at the moment and I can't see that slackening off and that's the message we got from the case officer. So uh, the time scale from here is that we uh, go to policy and resources in September uh, depending on, we, we then go back to the case officer with our draft application form uh, for her views and comments. Uh, if she's positive with that, then, then we will go in October to the lottery with the final project. If she's not, it will be December, but that will be the latest we would go given committee approval from policy and resources. Pete Councillor Carson and Councillor Geddes. Thanks, Chair. I, I'm, I'm not sure we should be too concerned about uh, an ever-increasing capacity for the archives. Um, you know, nowadays, the majority, if not all, documents are digitised in the first place. Um, there, there's very few uh, paper uh, records 
that need to be kept. And I would, I would suggest that in the future we actually have less paper records than we've got at the moment as, as, the, as they're digitised with no requirement to actually have paper copies at all. So I'm, I'm not too concerned about uh, uh, looking too far in the future with regards to, to, to storage. Thank you. Councillor Geddes. Well, I, I don't want to truncate, uh, to, to be seen to be trying to truncate discussion, Chair, uh, on what is a hugely important issue for the whole of the Freak and Gallery, although I have more than a little sympathy for the, the comments that, 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 that Councillor Scobie made earlier. But the blunt fact of the matter, sir, is I have moved a procedural motion that we proceed to determine this today. Thanks very much. Second for Councillor Geddes. Councillor Driver. Up. May I request some advice, please? Um, are we recommending, in effect, to PNR that this is the proposal? Are we recommending, or are we agreeing the site? Therefore, it's set in, in tablets of stone. Could I please have a? It's um, the remit of this committee to decide where the site is, and then, in terms of finance, that is a matter for the um, Policy and Resources Committee. So, no, you won't be getting a chance at Policy and Resources to revisit the site argument. That will be determined today if that is the wish of the member. So, have you got an alternative to the motion proposed? Uh, yes, quite happy then. I think we should uh, not agree. We should, we've considered the four listed options. Uh, I cannot agree to the UIT. I, I simply have to say that at this stage. Second up. Sir Thompson. Chair, I'm, uh, I'm not rushing into second at this point, but uh, it's actually just, is there also an issue to do with planning given there's a sort of delisted building? So is that, I mean, obviously whatever we decide today would have to then be approved, if you like, by other committees, if you like. No, we, we, are, we are determining the site, but at the end of the day, we haven't got the power to determine the uh, finance. That is a matter for the policy committee. The same way any other committee, if we're putting in a bid for lottery funding, we've got to get the match funding from the policy resources. No, Councillor Scobie. Thank you, Chairman. As I understand that we have a motion from Councillor Geddes, seconded by Councillor Driver, in effect, the procedural motion, which would be that we are in a position to determine the four sites today. Can I just have clarity on Councillor Maitland's amendment, please? I don't think I'm going to get a seconder, so I'm quite happy to say it suggests that I don't think we uh, should, I don't think we should agree the year at this stage. Um, so I am proposing we do not agree the year. Just to clarify, the, the, the position would be procedurally, the First Amendment would be to actually determine whether or not you wish to oppose the procedural motion, which in effect is to decide whether or not we choose the four sites first. We'll then go on to the next stage Understood. to select the four sites. Understood. Okay, right. Well, in which case, then I think I have to say no, I, I disagree with that. And I, will, I, I will propose the opposite. Sector? The Sector Amendment falls. I want to. Uh, I agree the site today. I did move earlier on that I think that bearing in mind it's been uh, looked at by officers and scored, and the one that scores the best would appear to be the York Library site, and uh, I would so move. We have a sector, Councillor Driver. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Just, just to come back in about expansion later on. Expansion isn't it just about out the way, it could be up the way as well. And if we get uh, some people to, or architects to say that this can future proof it going up the way, then we haven't got a problem. Is there any amendment? Councillor Maitland? Uh, yes, my, my amendment is that we do not agree with you. The second of Councillor Ma uh, Maitland? No, amendment falls. May I have my dissent recorded? You may have your dissent recorded. Thank you so much. So the committee is determined to be the York Library site. Um, choice and site is made. Report will be presented to the Policy and Resources Committee requesting commitment of match funding for the project. And 2 4 note that once the preferred site is chosen, it will be a stage one heritage lottery fund application by the October deadline. Members agree to that? Thank you. Six. Which is the community and customer services revenue monitoring report. And uh, gives the members overview of the current financial position facing CCS. Forecasted overspend of 225k, which management team is currently managing. And I'll hand you over to Mr. Haswell. Do you wish to add anything to this report? Uh, very little to add, uh, Chairman. We, we've identified at this early stage in the year a potential overspend of 225. I've detailed where it arises. It largely arises uh, the fact that we've not been able to be integrated quickly as we would have liked 
and we've not had a take up on early retirement. I can tell members that that has changed since a recent decision taken by the Policy and Resources Committee. I fully anticipate that we'll put in a balanced budget at the end of the current financial year. And we'll be bringing monitoring reports back on a regular basis, and the management team will address these issues. Any questions for Mr. Haswell? Finlay? Thanks, Chair. Uh, I'm a bit concerned about the, the community's facilities review not moving as forward as, as quickly as it might be when the communities are actually very much in favour of uh, community properties being transferred. Uh, a, a prime example is Glen, Glen Ken's community uh, hall, of where the community have worked very hard um, uh, to actually take control of the building there, put together a, a, a viable uh, a project going forward, and also uh, looked at an amalgamation of uh, the trustees of the, the, the town hall there, or whatever. But um, it would appear at the final hour that uh, the officers have been suggesting that they uh, adopt a three-year management plan, uh, which has, has sort of taken the wind out of their sails. Um, it would appear that the same sort of thing's happening in New Galloway Town Hall. I, I just wonder why that there seems to the, the foot's been taken off the accelerator in this instance, where communities are, are actually quite keen um, uh, to, to take over properties. One certain uh, stumbling block appears to be the reluctance the council to do a, a, a survey of the buildings to give the, the communities an idea of what the, the ongoing maintenance costs might be and a lack of information of how much funding might be available from the council to, uh, to address um, you know, the business being fit for purpose in terms of roofs and uh, electrics. Um, but certainly uh, at the Glen Cairns Community Centre in, in particular, um, I've got a meeting this afternoon, but there is concern that there's a, a lack of um, enthusiasm from the, the council to actually uh, push this project through. Richard, you want to answer that one? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of the specific detail of the Glen Kins uh, matter, um, but I will uh, speak to colleagues and come back to Councillor Carson directly in, in, in that regard. There's certainly no uh, lack of desire for, from officers to try and move forward uh, on the uh, on the proposals or indeed the community positions that were agreed by members. Uh, so I would suggest that uh, in some areas uh, there's been a change of appetite from some of the development management committees in terms of their desire to take on facilities. Um, and uh, I guess in other areas where uh, we've, uh, we've been looking to do condition surveys, there's certainly no reluctance to identify the works nor the cost of the works that's required, perhaps the timeline and the works that uh, both in terms of the condition surveys and indeed the capital works have not been taken forward as quickly as we perhaps would like. But certainly on the case, and there's certainly no, no desire for us to, to, to move back from, from this direction of travel, which is uh, which is agreed by members. Thanks very much indeed, sir. Let me make it clear, Chair, that I have no objections whatsoever to, to, to the, uh, the arrangements that are being currently adopted, uh, as it were, in transferring properties to community trusts, etc., under this particular process. Uh, I think it's right and proper uh, that these organisations should be taken by the hand, if I can use the colloquialism. What does concern me, however, is that we have a historical legacy uh, of uh, other uh, organisations being saddled uh, with properties uh, which do not, uh, in fact, wh which, which really uh, are, 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 in certain cases, are, are, are approaching nightmarish uh, in, in the situation that these organisations are having to deal with. And I would seek the assurance sir, that the council uh, will revisit, uh, you know, these historical arrangements at the first possible opportunity to bring them into line with the more enlightened attitude that has been displayed and uh, shown in relation to the current uh, raft of transfer proposals to voluntary organisations. Mr. Reid, can you want to reply to that? Happy to give council again. It's that assurance uh, through you, Chair. We'll uh, certainly uh, uh, pick up on these matters and make sure that this uh, approach that we're now taking is consistent with your plan. Thank you. Take council. Can others then, Councillor Marshall? Uh, just briefly, I think at 0.8%, I think it's sharply okay, uh, certainly at the moment, but I would just like the reassurance that come uh, 2015, the new year, we, we expect to see that realigned uh, into a much more uh, positive situation. Uh, just it's with, with reference to top of page 95, um, obviously identifying the, the potential shortfall of 125,000, both on the commu community facilities review and the integration of libraries, CSC, and registrars. I think we all knew that 
the timescales are quite ambitious when you look at the complicated nature of actually going into consultation then with an alternatives. I'm just a little bit concerned though with regards to the final sentence of that paragraph when it says further measures to seek to max maximise the level of savings available in the current year and an, on an ongoing basis are currently being progressed. Is that within the agreed budget uh, identified uh, sites or is this additional um, that has not been agreed through the budget? It's not additional, sir. We, we, we can't make savings that members have not agreed as part of the budget design process. So what, what, are, what are those further measures then? Have you got examples of what those further measures may be? I don't have that detail, but I could give Councillor Marshall a copy of the, the detailed stuff. I think what we're trying to do is make sure that we're accelerating any works that are required to buildings and things like that to get them. Because first thing we do is we look at a building and we say, right, we could put all these people into it and then you go into a long process of procuring works in the building. We're trying to accelerate those and bring those forward as quickly as we can. And we've got cooperation from colleagues elsewhere in the council on that. Thompson. Thank you. Actually, um, if it would be all right through yourself, Chair, could I get a copy of those details as well? Because that's something that interests me. Thank you. Make sure you get that. Any further questions? No. We move to the recommendations. That's mainly to uh, note items 2 1 to 2 4. Members happy with that? Move on to item 7, which is the uh, Revenues and Benefits Service Progress Report. And uh, it was very good news in that one that the uh, inclusion and assessment team managed to get additional benefits of £6 million pounds for clients in this area. So I think that's to be, uh, to be welcomed. Do you have anything to add to the uh, report? Take questions, member. Councillor Driver. Thanks very much. You're obviously in, in October. There's going to be issues with regard to council tax for second homes, and I've had a few uh, um, constituents come to my, my, brought this to my attention. I'm just wondering about uh, this: is there any chance of a report further down the line to say what this, what effect this is actually going to have on 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 council tax uh, budgets and um, members of the public? Well? Is it on there? Sorry. Uh, yeah, happy to bring forward uh, uh, a report. Uh, members will recall that uh, this policy was agreed last December through p and committee. Um, at, at that stage, the intelligence around the, the number of properties that could be um, affected by uh, this policy was unclear. We've done a lot of work on that in terms of uh, surveying and canvassing and getting additional information. So it's probably timely to bring forward that information and also uh, further considerations around the policy basis for members uh, to consider. So we're happy to do that. Um, and it'll, it'll go back to in, in our committee in September. Further questions? No? Members happy to uh, accept the recommendations at 2 1, 2 2, 2 3, and 2 4. Thank you very much. Move on to item 8, which is the uh, DG1 update position, report by Director of Community and Customer Services. Uh, Mr. Haswell, anything to add to this? Uh, no, nothing really to add, uh, Chairman. The intention of bringing the report was to make sure members are up to speed of where we are with the Temple Pool and Hall. Uh, there will be a, a more detailed report on financials coming back to Policy and Resources Committee, I think, or perhaps even to the full council to stand on that. But we will, we will be bringing members back. We're currently in a sort of a process review through court. So it's all court, court hearings are now about process rather than the actual substantives of any case. So we're really nothing to bring forward on any case. We are working on it. You'll see that Keir Northern have now drawn in some subcontractors into, into the case. Uh, we're adjusting pleadings and we'll take that forward. Thank you. Councillor Geddes. I uh, crave your indulgence, sir. Uh, paragraph 5.1, it was just to repeat my earlier observation. Uh, it talks there about the Lordburn Hall Community Trust confirming to the Council that, based on the scope of the works presented, they would be willing to take responsibility for the building on a full cost lease basis once the need for temporary provision has ceased. 
the point I would make, sir, is that if we're not careful, uh, you know, this, and I'm not patronising uh, the trust, but if we're not careful, you finish up in the same situation uh, as has happened elsewhere in Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, and I would ask that, in fact, very careful consideration is given by the council to any such arrangement, because the last thing I would want to see is this authority being left open to the accusation that, you know, you hived it off and the full knowledge that, you know, this organisation would struggle in the future to upkeep and maintain it in an acceptable fashion. The point I'm making is that, you know, you should be look, we should be looking at ways of taking this particular organisation by the hand on the same basis that we're taking other organisations by the hand. Could, can, can I give Councillor Geddes the assurance that we're working with the organisation? We have a full business plan and business case, and it will come back to members for member final determination. I'm happy with that assurance with you, uh, through you, sir. Any further questions? Councillor May? Well, I'll, I'll also make the point that there were a certain number of members who were assured uh, that uh, that was what the deal was, that it was to be on a full cost basis, um, that, that, uh, that this money was spent. And there are those of us who feel a bit grumpy about that. You can record your dissent again if you want, however. Councillor Carson, did you have anything you wanted to... Uh... Members, any further questions? No? Happy to accept the recommendations? Okay, thank you very much. I have no further business. Thank you all for your attendance.